Welcome back to the Nerd Nest Podcast. It's me, Bill. It's Russ. How's it going, Russ? Good. I'm looking forward to this very intimate episode of Nerd Nest. <laughs> That's right. It's just the two of us. This is two weeks in a row where it was ju you just got two co-hosts, and I think it worked pretty well last week. And I think that Russ and I can capture the magic again uh, this week. Uh, this week, I want to look at this juxtaposition between the the triple i initiative which we teased a couple weeks ago and then rich and i had a very long conversation last week about what constitutes an indie game um which i think might resurface a little bit during our conversation today and then i want to i want to put that up against what's happening in the triple a space these days uh and just kind of have a conversation about those two things we'll also Obviously, with Russ here, we got to talk about emulation. Mm. Uh, there's some big stuff there. We've got the Fallout show, uh, and everybody's getting back into the old Fallout games. So we've got a lot to talk about today, plus the games that we've been playing. Let's start things off with the I showcase. Um, for everybody that is unaware, some of the bigger independent uh, publishers and developers got together, and they said, why do we got to wait for a Nintendo Direct to do stuff? Let's just... Let's just make our own show. And I would say it was put together extremely well. So I posted this in our show notes and I said, Russ, why don't you pick one game <laughs> that you want to talk about from this list? Because it's it's comprehensive. There's a lot of stuff in there. And I'll do the same thing. So, Russ, what one game from the Triple I initiative um, presentation did you come away thinking, oh man, that that's got my that's got my name on it? You know, uh, it's funny, as you were like kind of mentioned that I had this like feeling of nostalgia for back in the day when we used to go to Blockbuster and you would see a wall of games and all of those were just like a tiny investment, like the three dollars to rent it for the weekend kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what it feels like when you're looking at these indie games. They're not a huge investment in your time and money because they're usually shorter and cheaper. And, and there's so many right now. And this just scrolling through this website of all the triple I games, it's like overwhelming. Like there's so many and that's an awesome place to be in. Anyway, among all of them, the one that I that like caught my eye the most is What the Car, which is like a spinoff of What the Golf. And that's a game I've been wanting to play forever. It's been in my library forever, um, but I've never actually played it. And so I like cars a lot more than playing golf. And so it's like a perfect mix for me where it's this kind of cutesy like um just animated style that I really like uh, in terms of just almost like cell shaded in a way. And then also it's got that really great uh, like kind of indie feel to it as well. Right. If I, if I remember correctly, I played what the golf a couple of times and it has like, basically like you, you play golf by, you know, pulling back and then letting it, letting, letting the, the golf ball go forward. But, a lot of times unexpected things happen. Mm. So like you imagine that you're going to hit the ball and what happens is instead is the entire hole goes flying or something like that. And it seems like they're applying that, um, subvert your expectations right. to this car game as well. And that looks really cool. Did, uh, yeah. did you play what the golf? Uh, I did not like I had it in my library forever. I still have never played it. The thing about this one, too, I was just reading about it. it there's a demo out already. And so as soon as we're done with this show, I'm going to test this out of what the car and see how that is. Oh, awesome. Very cool. Um, the one that I wanted to talk about is is one that I would say subverted my expectations because as I was watching the video, I was like, oh, cool. They got like a they got like an Age of Empires Mm. clone in here <laughs> and then like the camera pans off to the right and suddenly for some for some reason dinosaurs uh, <laughs> come in and they attack the the city that you are um you know that you're building and basically that's what this is it's called dino lords it's from north play and ghost ship publishing uh here's what uh it says over at GameSpot. It's uh, you're a knight who rides dinosaurs in this uh, is in the works for PC and it's got a new trailer during the showcase. You can uh, wish list it now on Steam. Doesn't look like it has a demo as far as playing on handheld. I, I'm not sure how this one will work on handheld. I don't know if it's something that's going to require you to to use mouse and keyboard 
Mm. But I love the idea of those Age of Empires like games, which I used to pour hours and hours into. Um, and then just having, okay, now you got dinosaurs. Let's let's screw things up. <laughs> I think that that's really cool. Yeah, I love it. I love the idea of just, yeah, kind of undermining the whole uh, genre on its own, you know. And another thing I saw is just there's a ton of sequels, you know, like um, mm-hmm. there's Cat Quest 3, which sounds funny, but like my, my oldest son was at the perfect age and time when Cat Quest 1 first came out. So he loves that series. And so that was like his first role-playing game experience. So it's awesome. There's now a third one out there. And then I, I really like the look of that uh, Rogue Prince of Persia as well. So that'll be pretty awesome. Yeah, that one does look really interesting. It's funny because Rich and I talked about this last week. We were like, what, what constitutes an indie game? And so here's my question to you, Russ. We've got, you know, an independent studio, Evil Empire. They're partnering with Ubisoft, clearly not an independent studio. Uh, but they're making this uh, this roguelike featuring the, the, the uh, Prince of Persia IP. And do you... Uh, consider that to be indie still yeah for me an indie game is about the feel it's more about like the time and the price and things like that as opposed to the actual development of it uh you know i'm I'm big into music and my typical genre is what they call indie rock and there's nothing independent about that anymore it's just a sound Mm. at this point you know what i mean and so that's Mm -hmm. what it is for me too is that indie games are a sound or a feel in the sense that it's like okay is this that kind of expectation of you know easy to get into and not going to take up a ton of my time Uh, the whole development team size and the publisher and stuff it's just all kind of it's like a record label i don't really pay attention yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I love that this game is going to be uh, a, a Metroidvania roguelike, which is exactly what Evil Empire is really good at. Um, and it features like this known IP, which is strange mm. that we were getting this known IP right after, like it's right. right on the heels of another Prince of Persia game that's also yeah. a side-scrolling platformer Metroidvania style game. So that's weird. But I like that this is a roguelike so that, you know, you you can, there's lots and lots of replay value there. And I also really like the art style. I think that it looks, it has a very cool look to it. Yeah, I almost feel like uh, they're just using the name Prince of Persia, like, because maybe Ubisoft gave them the money for it, you know, but it's like, it could have been a different name, a different character style, and it still would have been amazing. Yeah, you know, I can't think off the top of my head, and if anybody watching this can think of one or if you can think of one russ um i can there's been many times where i've said to myself this game is really good would have done much better if it was called this Mm. where basically you could have like a known ip attached to it even if the game is completely the same but you call it this known ip and people will suddenly pay attention to it. There's been lots of times where I've seen that in the past because there's nothing about this in particular that screams Prince of Persia. Mm. It's just another side-scrolling roguelike Metroidvania. Not that that's a bad thing, um, but if you if it wasn't labeled Prince of Persia, do you feel like people would have said, oh, that's is that a Prince of Persia game? Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like, oh, it's so similar to Prince of Persia. Maybe they knocked it off or something. You know, it's 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 just interesting that, you know, you can tell the difference between this game and like a different Prince of Persia game because the conversation is not, oh, there's a new Prince of Persia game. The conversation is there's a no new roguelike Metroidvania out and it's Prince of Mm -hmm. Persia. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of the differentiating factor for me. It's not about like the title of the game or anything. It's that they're pushing the genre. They're not necessarily pushing the title. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we we brought up Ubisoft. So we may as well use that as a transition uh, from indie into the triple a, or according to Ubisoft, sometimes quadruple a, um, (laughs) we get, they've, they're, they're in hot water right now and they're in hot water for quite a few reasons. Um, I put out a video last week about the whole controversy with the way that they're pricing the new star Wars game. And I got a lot of people mad at me for saying that I'm fine with $70 as a price point for a big game like this. And you guys can be mad. That's totally fine. I, it doesn't, doesn't, I'm not upset about that. Um, but the reason why I felt like 
Ubisoft to step it on a rake here is not because of the $70 price point. Although I do understand why people don't like that. I would prefer cheaper games myself. Uh, but the fact that they're removing levels and putting those levels only in the more expensive version, and the more expensive versions are a lot more expensive, like $60 more expensive. Mm. And then there's another version on top of that that is like, I think you can go all the way up to $130, which includes two DLCs that you don't know anything about. So that's a gamble right there. Um, missions that have been removed from the core game but you will have access to those on day one. And then a bunch of cosmetics, which I, I don't care. If they want to add cosmetics and charge people for them, I'm fine with that. That doesn't affect anything. Uh, but then, like, the, 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 the thing that they're really selling you for the Ultimate Edition is a PDF, basically. It's just a digital art book. And I'm like, come on. It's so... <laughs> that's so lame. And a lot of people who watched my video, they were like, well, I'm not buying it. And that's fine. But Ubisoft is not the only ones doing this kind of thing. You know what I mean? What you like, what's your reaction? Are you, how, what's your reaction to that, Russ? Yeah. So uh, initially, you know, my, my thing is it doesn't affect me at all. Cause I, I never really pay for the premium one. I I've also mm -hmm. heard that you'll get like early access if you buy the premium one. So you can like pay to play it a few days early. I always, I never, that's not a thing that ever applies to me. You know what I mean? I got so many right. games to play. I don't need early access to anything, but the thing that bothers me about this whole thing is that they're hiding uh, different levels or different content from the base game in this kind of like uh, upper tier, you know, for me, I'm all about buying the base game, like because I, I know myself well enough to know that I probably won't ever finish the game and then also play the DLC like that is there's five games I can think of off the top of my head, like in Fallout 3 is like the main one where I actually bought the DLC the day it was available because I was like needing more content, Skyrim, stuff like that, you know, but that is few and far between. And so I always buy the base game and then just kind of see how it goes and I never get the DLC later. So I don't really mind that. But what bothers me is that am I getting the complete experience by only buying the base game as far as at least the launch experience? And if they have hidden levels or hidden content or whatever behind a different paywall and it's not going to be the full base experience game i have to pay more for that then that sucks because now i'm paying a premium just to get the like core gameplay element and so that to me is kind of bothersome yeah the, and, uh, we don't know how much right. they've removed um we also don't know any other microtransaction stuff because lately triple a games have been doing this this thing where they they ship a game um, they send it to reviewers. Reviewers, uh, you know, they have their embargo. They got to review it by a certain day. They hit their, their target. They review it. They post their reviews. And then on launch day, along comes the cash shop with a bunch of other stuff that the reviewers who just reviewed the game didn't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, Ubisoft doing, like, I don't know if they're going to do that kind of thing. I don't know how extensive the mission that's been removed is. There's a lot of things that we don't know but the idea that there's content that would be in the main game but was removed so that people would pay more for it, that feels scummy to me. That feels like it feels like the same complaint that we had about DLC a long time ago. And then companies stopped announcing DLC like day one DLC. Like they said, right. Okay, well we won't we won't talk about that anymore. Does that mean that they didn't stop removing stuff and putting in dlc no i don't think so they just stopped talking about it and maybe this mission is really inconsequential and doesn't matter and and doesn't have any effect on the main story that's fine too but again i don't like that it was removed from the main part of the game like sell me a game right. and then if you want to do bonus stuff don't make it feel obligational yeah it almost makes you think like okay so they had this full game and then they pulled parts out of it to sell later on or whatever. Why did they do that? Is it because it sucks? Like they, it didn't meet their like creative idea of how the game is going to work. And they were like just chopping it like you would any other time that you're just kind of editing a game down and, and shipping it. Right. So mm. then they just took like the B sides basically and then put that as something you have to pay extra for. But if it's so <laughs> bad that it wasn't in the main content, why are they going to charge you extra so that you can play it? You know what I mean? Like, it's just bad optics. Like I, I would have preferred that. Yeah, they would say, "Hey, we've got these other missions that didn't quite make it into the final cut. 
uh, like this is months later, right? So they're like, hey, we got these other <laughs> missions here. If you want to pay ten dollars for it, here you go. You know what I mean? That that is awesome. Like that's like buying a B side when you're buying like an album, or whatever. Totally up for that. Like that's cool. I don't want to has that like have that day one and then have to pay a premium for it. I don't know. You know I want what? The you core just rem- content. Go ahead. Sorry. That's it. I just I was gonna say just reiterating. I want the core like gameplay. Like what do the artists envision in terms of the release package of that game? That's what I want to play. You just made me think of something, and it's not like a fully formed thought yet. So maybe there's like uh, reasons why this doesn't work. But you just made me think of movies, mm. uh, like a director's cut. So like you go to the movies, you see a movie, and you're like, man, I freaking loved that movie. Now, there were a lot of scenes that that got cut out, and maybe the director wanted those scenes in for some reason, but they cut them down for time in order to make sure that they could maximize how many theaters would be able to show this X times a day or whatever. Um, and then the Blu-ray comes out or streaming service or whatever, you know, and the director's cut comes out and you're like oh i'm gonna buy the director's cut i I would get more stuff that's kind of like what you're describing yeah but at the same time what's actually happening is that the movie is out in theaters it it comes out tomorrow i've pre-bought my tickets right and when i show up to the theater they have it they have the director's cut (laughs) up on the marquee and then they have the non-director's cut up on the marquee and I'm sitting here looking at my ticket trying to make a decision did I get screwed here am right. I missing something and that it feels like the same thing to me that's happening with the Star Wars stuff yeah video games are art right and if I went to a movie theater and I saw two different versions I'd be like I'm not going to watch either I'm going to wait six months and then find out which one was the better one and then I'll watch it then and that's how I would feel about the Star Wars game. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, is it worth buying that one? Like, should I spend the extra $10? I'm not really sure. Should I even just get it at all? Let's kind of let the dust settle, you know, as opposed to a single vision where they're like, this is the theatrical release of this game, you know, like that's what I want to see. Director's cut and all that stuff. Yeah, let's do that later. But right now, give me the best product you can and, and give me a standard like $70 price for it. Right. Or 60 you know, because I would, <laughs> right. I, I want to, I want to spend less, but I also understand why it's seventy. Um, two things can be true at the same time. Speaking of multiple re- things can being true at the same time, Ubisoft can be in trouble for multiple reasons <laughs> at the same time. Um, just last week, Rich and I were talking about game preservation and Sarah Bond, uh, who's in charge over at uh, Xbox, and she said that they've got a team together uh to work on game preservation which i love that they're saying that then you know on the other side of that coin you have ubisoft who recently made a lot of people mad because they shut down the servers for the crew and that kind of prompted uh i i don't have the story handy right now but that kind of prompted somebody to set up and we talked about it on last week's episode but they set up like this stop killing games um Mm. petition basically uh, like a website that helped people to make complaints to their local government offices to try and convince these companies to stop this kind of practice well ubisoft didn't go far enough or they decided that they didn't go far enough because yes they shut down the servers and so the game is unplayable but then they said you know what why don't we just take these games out of people's libraries games that people have paid for this comes to us from euro uh euro gamer uh basically ubisoft is revoking the crew from owners libraries after they shut down the servers people are getting this message you no longer have access to the game (laughs) why not check the store to pursue your your adventures uh russ (laughs) what do you think about that man you know, especially in like my world where it's all about, you know, emulation, preservation, being able to play these games even after the publisher thinks that, you know, they don't want to invest in it anymore. There are people who want to. And so this this goes right in the face of people who want to play this like on a private server. Like the idea of coming up with some sort of server like process where you can then play the game and kind of have it maintained. The crew is a great example. This is like an always online game. So it does require <laughs> like those servers to play. Um 
But man, that's a shame. Like to actually just remove the game. It's like the Men in Black like kind of light. We're like, Boonk. like this never happened, you know. Um, and that's that's a shame. Like like you should be able to open this up. Like Ubisoft's not going to invest any more money in it. Great. Let other people invest their time and money in it now. You know what I mean? Like it's not going. You're not going to lose anything. It's their IP or whatever. Maybe they're trying to preserve it for the crew too or whatever. But all the same, like that would just go a long way towards kind of feeding that fan base. There's there's nothing wrong with like letting somebody else enjoy a game after you've decided that you don't want to invest in it anymore. It's kind of a bummer. It yeah, absolutely a bummer. You know, a, a really good example of somebody who. I'm going to say did it right, but took them a really long time to do it right would be City of Heroes. Because City of mm -hmm. Heroes, I think that there was like a lawsuit that kind of went back and forth about City of Heroes. But eventually, the people who own the rights to City of Heroes said, as long as you're not doing this for profit, here's the, here's the stuff that you need in order to make your own servers. And as long as you're not doing it to make money, we don't care. That's awesome. And that, that I think is fantastic. You know what I would love to see is just a company that like the whole point of the company is to save the games and like, they're, they're, like they know how to implement server structure and that kind of stuff. And when, when a company like Ubisoft decides, you know what, the crew doesn't need, you know, it's not making us any money. Let's shut down the servers. They then say, here you go. You can be in charge of this now. And it's like a open source kind of company that allows them to do this so that, you know, maybe end users wouldn't even have to worry about it. Right. Um, and then they could, they, they could say, all right, well, if you want to play on our servers, it's like a, I don't know, two bucks or something you know, a one-time fee right. of two bucks in order to get an account or something. And that way they would still have, make enough money so that they could keep these servers alive because a lot of these servers are going to have very few people playing on them. Yeah. I mean, I understand the reason Ubisoft is shutting down the crew servers is because not a lot of people were playing it. Okay, that's understandable. That also means it's not expensive to maintain. Right. Uh, another reason I think had something to do with licensing for music and licensing for cars like all of those things kind of come together and get in the way, but there's got to be some kind of way around it. What's your favorite game, Russ, that got shut down that you can't play anymore? Uh, before I answer that, I had another idea about the crew that I just wanted to go down real quickly. And so yeah. thinking about Ubisoft and like their, their ability to kind of maintain these servers, maybe it's not super expensive, whatever. What if they were transparent about it? What if they just said, you know what, here's a bounty. Like it has to reach this amount for us to maintain these servers. This is how much oh. it costs us. If you guys want to donate or whatever, pay Ubisoft bucks or whatever, and if we reach this threshold, have it like a, a, a like one of those like donation lines, you know, like a charity drive. If you reach this point this month, we'll we'll keep the servers up, but this year or whatever, right? And so it like brings it back to the people where they're saying, sure, if you want to keep this going, you got to pay us a little bit of money because we need to run our servers. We are a business, but it gives people the ability to be able to say, you know what? I love this game so much. I put so much time into it. I It's worth it for me to give another $20 to keep this running and let people have the choice. You know what I mean? I could see that getting abused real fast, though. Oh, sure. Absolutely. But <laughs> <laughs> there'd have to be something to keep them. I don't know if there's a solution. If, if anybody else can think of a solution, let us know in the comments. But right. I could see them being like, Boy, it sure would be a shame if we were to shut your servers down. This game just came out. What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, but like, you know, we're a business. You got to yeah. we can't we can't just maintain them for free. Oh, you know uh. what? These servers got way more expensive. The bounty's going up. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I see all yeah. that happening too, but I don't know. I'm an idealist. Now, in terms yeah. of like games that you just can't play anymore that are online, uh I've never played an online game like I, I like other than destiny, like destiny is my first like online experience and I've never, I haven't fired up destiny one in a long time to see if that will still work and all that. I have no idea. Uh, but a lot of my favorite elements of destiny one are now in destiny two, like the taken King, which is like a, a, a DLC element uh, during destiny one, which is like my prime time when I was into the game, that's actually available. You can do the raid on destiny two. And so that's kind of cool, but I, yeah, unfortunately I don't really play online games, so I can't really think of anything. Well, I mean, all right, you brought up destiny real mm -hmm. quick. Like, did you, like, I, I saw, I know that you were a destiny fan. So when I saw the announcement, 
I'm not really into Destiny all that much. I've played it a bunch in the past, but what, are you excited to get back into it with this new thing that people seem excited for? Uh, no, I'm like five DLCs behind. Like I can hear less <laughs> about the storyline or that stuff. I do this thing, it's called Vanguard Strikes and that. So basically all you do is you just boot up Destiny 2, you go into this Van Di- Vanguard Strikes playlist. And so it's just like a playlist of like 20 minute episodes of gaming where it's you mm. and two other dudes and they're random or whatever. And so you just jump in and you play for 20 minutes on this little mini mission. And it could, and it's a playlist, so you could play the same one over, but they have enough replayability that it's like a perfect 20 minute experience for me. Jump in and usually the guys are higher level than me. So they're kind of like sherping me, you know, like getting me along. But either way, like I'm, I'm playing a little bit of the game. I don't really have to pay attention to the story. Bungie games are all about just like shooting and the fun and the mechanics of it and stuff. And so that's what I play when I play Destiny. I've, I've no longer like followed like any of the stories, any of that stuff. I don't, I don't know about that, but I like just playing Vanguard Strikes. And so that's what I do. My favorite genre is MMOs. I absolutely love MMOs. The idea of the game world continuing to do stuff while I'm not there playing uh, that is fascinating to me. And uh, for a while there, when World of Warcraft was like top dog, everybody kept trying to make the next MMO. And I kept trying those MMOs. And I would mm. I would have some fun playing those MMOs. But most of them fell on their face hard. And you can't play almost any of them anymore. Uh, and the ones that you can't that you can still play have changed so much that they're they're not quite the same as they were back when I was younger. It's weird. It's like, you know, you're the king of emulation. You know, you play these old games and it take, takes you back to when you were younger. Mm. And when I play those MMOs that I used to love in, you know, my early 20s, like those games, even the ones that exist, they have changed so much. It's not the same game. Yeah. And the perfect example is EverQuest. There's there's a copy of it called Project 99, which I've played a couple of times, and it's really cool and does take me back. But if I loaded up EverQuest today, completely different animal right. than when I played um, a million years ago in that little tiny window surrounded by, um, you know, gray stuff uh, on the sides, which constantly covered up your screen. It was just <laughs> it's it's weird, and I wish that I wish that those games all still existed in some way yeah it's crazy uh you know i it happens in destiny like you know you get a gun and you're like this is it this is end game like i feel awesome this is great and then they throw out an update and all of a sudden those guns are useless you have to get the new ones and stuff and um i i do wonder what's going to happen when destiny 2 like goes away like it's such a big beast at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a shame that 20 years from now, I can't just play Destiny 2 again, like the way that yeah. I am right now. And it would be it would be a really cool game to play as a single player game, too. Like, just because yeah. the mechanics are really good. Yeah, it feels so good. That's what keeps me coming back to it. I don't, I don't you know, I don't do any competitive multiplayer stuff. I don't do any of that. I can't really follow the DLCs because I don't have the time investment for it. But man, 20 minutes of playing Destiny 2 is always fun for me. I just love it. You know, I've got my mechanics down, throwing my grenades, throwing my knives, you know, all that stuff. I just really enjoy it. Well, you didn't play any Destiny 2 this week. Instead, you played some other games. So why don't we yeah. take a second, talk about the games that we played this week. And then we will talk on emulation, and uh, we actually got a lot of emulation stuff. And then finally, some weird monetization suggestions. And uh, we also want to talk a little. I want to talk a little bit about Fallout. Uh, mm-hmm. So, what have you been playing this week, Russ? Pick one. Yeah. So I. Um... Strangely enough, I haven't been reviewing a lot of PCs lately. I've got a couple handheld PCs I've been working on, like MSI Claw. I still need to finish that review video. I want to do an update on the Legion Go as well. Um, and and then also, I haven't been doing a lot of mini PC reviews. I used to do one like every two weeks. So I was always up on like testing games and doing all that stuff. But it's been like two months where I didn't really do anything. Well, I've got a few that I've been working on now. And um, so I was like, okay, now's the time to try out Helldivers 2, basically. Or I was like, that's the oh. game a lot of people are playing. And so I, sh- I should figure out how this works. And I felt like it would be a pretty good match for the Legion Go as well. I like playing third-person games with the with the like FPS controls. I don't like playing FPS games like that. So my, okay. my go-to game on the Legion Go has been Risk of Rain 2 because you can like see your guy and you have the reticle. And so that's always been like a lot easier to experience as opposed to FPS. It's just too like limited for me. Anyway... Um, 
So I was like, this is a great fit, you know, for all this testing and whatnot. I like it. You know, I went through the tutorial and then I just started playing fast missions. And I was like, this is kind of like a Vanguard strike, you know, in Destiny, mm -hmm. where I can just push the X button and it's going to throw me into a room with a bunch of other people who know what they're doing. And I'll just kind of figure it out and hopefully I don't make it worse for them, you know. Um, I like it. You know, I, I really like shooting things which you don't do as much as you wish you would. You know, I spend so much time running and like trying to figure out the menus of like, oh, I'm supposed to drop something right now and it's going to be a big bomb or whatever. And I'm like, what button combination and all that stuff? Like it's, there's a lot going on that you really just have to get acclimated to in terms of the mechanics of it. But when it's just shooting a bug or shooting a robot, like it's like fun. Other than like, I'm very watchful of my ammo. That's something I've never really thought about. It's like how far I am in the clip. I've got like, you know, I think Carrie mentioned it when we talked about this game previously. I've got like this muscle reaction where as soon as I'm done shooting anything, I'm going to hit the reload button. Yeah. And that's a Destiny 2 kind of thing, you know. Uh, this game will punish you for that. They're like, why are you throwing all that clip away, you know. And so that's been a really interesting experience. But yeah, I'm enjoying it. I don't think I will like turn into a Helldivers 2 player. But uh, I like that I was able to play a more modern game around the same time that everyone else was playing. It, it was kind of cool. Yeah, that, I, that game is fantastic. I have not played it in weeks. I feel like it's that it was it was really a moment of the zeitgeist where mm -hmm. everybody was playing it, and I was having an absolute blast with it. And I haven't had, I have not had a single bad experience other than like just trying to connect with friends. Where mm -hmm. like, are you online? Yeah, I'm online, but it says you're not online, and like then we just kind of go back and forth trying to figure out. Who's actually online? Here, let me shut down my game. Here, you shut down your game. We'll both turn them back on and see if we could see each other now. Like that experience, I had bad experiences, but once you're in the game, I never once had a bad experience in that game. Yet, right now, I have no desire to play it. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the game isn't good, it's just because I'm obsessed and not allowing, I'm obsessed with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And I'm not allowing myself to touch anything else <laughs> uh, because I know what will happen is I will start playing something else and I will never get back to Rebirth. Mm. And I want to find out what happens with the um, what's different in the story. Um, yeah. So I will say I'm not going to talk about uh, Rebirth again because I've like sung its praises so much. But I was really disappointed to hear that it only sold two million copies so far. Mm. Um, which is really, really bad. And come on, uh, people, I need you to buy that game so that Square <laughs> Enix will make the third one because I got to find out what happens. Anyway, um, you also were playing The Last Guardian. That's a that's an older yeah. one. Are you doing that on uh, emulation or on old hardware? No, I'm just I'm playing on my PS5. Like I have the PS4 copy in my library digitally, and I was just like, you know what? Maybe today is the day where I will actually just play this game like on my PS5. And so I installed it and it's not a huge That was a PS4 file. game? Yeah, it was a PS4 game. It was supposed I to be a PS3 like... game and then it didn't release until oh. 2016. And so it ended up being a PS4 game, which actually okay. is a great point to talk about the game itself because it doesn't even it doesn't feel like a PS4 game. It doesn't feel like a PS3 game. It feels like a PS2 game and the mechanics and just kind of the way it moves and feels and stuff. Uh, it is almost like a retro game. It's what it feels like to me. It feels like I'm playing uh, something from like 2003 or so, even though it came out in 2016. And so that's been really interesting for me. Like there just, just remind me real quick yep. with that game. That's the game where you're like you've you're like a kid. And then you also have like uh, this big thing that's like a dragon, but like maybe maybe with fur or feathers yeah, it's like or a, something. A cat bird dragon, yeah. A cat bird dragon. Okay, just <laughs> making sure that I was thinking of the same right. game. And All so right, tell, it's, tell it's, us more. Yeah, it's by Team Ico. You know, who made the original Ico game, and then also um, Shadow of the Colossus. And so this is the third game. Uh, I loved Ico. I played that when it first launched. I thought it was just like super innovative and artsy and stuff. You know, back in like two thousand, two thousand one, or whatever. Uh, I never played Shadow of the Colossus. It was just always really daunting to me. I don't like boss fights. Like, I don't look forward to the boss fights. I want to just, like, mm. have, like, kind of low-stakes combat. But that game is all boss fights. Like, it's all it is. And so it was always just kind of not a good congruent mix in the way I like to play games. And so I never really got into Shadow of the Colossus. Like, I've never, never gotten to the point where I've got to the boss fight. I've just ran around in the first part to test emulation, and that's it. So this one, I was like, okay, this is a good mix. It's got, like a companion kind of thing where you've got your little dog cat thing or whatever. And then also uh, it, it has like a upgraded graphics and stuff like that too. 
I love the art style and all that. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to like. So essentially, let me explain how it works. So you, it's a puzzle game. When it comes down to mm -hmm. it, it is a it's a game where you're just getting from one area to the next area, and you have to use whatever mechanics to get there. And your dog cat thing is like a part of it. I say dog because it behaves like a dog, even though it looks like a cat bird. And so you you need like a special light that comes from this thing from its tail basically it's like this lightning light to unlock certain things and so you have like the ability to direct that light and that'll unlock whatever and then you also have to like get through like maybe you got to climb over something or go under something that kind of stuff and then then the dog cat can't follow you because it's too big and so you have to figure out how you can get it over there um so there is that kind of like discovery element to it um, but it's, it's not done very well. It's done very PS2 like <laughs> in the sense that you're just like, okay, let me pull up another tutorial because I don't know what I'm doing right now. You know, it doesn't have that half-life feel to it, you know, where you, you make a discovery in that game and you feel like a freaking genius. Like you're like, I can't believe I figured that out. That is not the way it was supposed to happen, but I made it work. And then it turns out it was the way it was supposed to happen, but you just feel so smart because of it. This game right. is the opposite where it's just like, oh my gosh, this game is broken. Like I've broken it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And it's because I'm standing one step too far or not far enough and it's not triggering whatever is happening. And the cat dog itself has its own like kind of AI to it and the thing's an idiot. And so it'll go to the <laughs> wrong spot or whatever. And you're trying to call it and it's not really coming, you know. And so it's frustrating in the kind of gameplay mechanics of it. But I, I don't know. I put like six hours into it. It's pretty far actually. Um so I'm enjoying it. I don't know if I'll finish it like now, but I, it is a game I feel like I can jump into later on as well. So I'm enjoying it. I, I guess it's worth the twenty dollars I spent on it, you know, five years ago or whatever. Yeah. Um. How long do you think is like the longest that you've owned a game before actually playing it? <laughs> Gosh, you know, um, the great a great example. And I don't want to go too quickly into this, but Fallout Four. <laughs> so. I bought that game like day one release, $60 or whatever on my Xbox One. I I booted up. I got a little bit far. I got to the point, and I think I've mentioned on this show before, but I got to the point where I said, okay, now you need to build your village. This is how to build a village or whatever. And I turned it off and never went back. So I maybe made it an hour into that game, right? And never went back. But guess what I fired up this week? <laughs> Fallout 4. Because oh, I was like, wow. it's been 10 years or whatever at this point. I don't know how long it's been. Maybe not 10, eight years or something. Um but man, that show was so good. I was like, I'm, I bought it for Steam and then installed that and the, the Game of the Year Fallout 3 version as well because um, I just want to go back into the universe. And so um, I, I want to play Fallout 3 more than 4, but I also want to have those like nice graphics of 4 as well. So I, I installed both. Well, I think, I, I could be wrong about this, but maybe it's just Fallout 4. Yeah, it's just Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 both got like updates related mm -hmm. to um like because the show is is popular and and people are uh excited about it uh, but they got a 200 percent player count boost along <laughs> the the game coming out so i well first off fallout 76 is like that's an online only game where well Okay, I can't really say that because I haven't played it. So I don't know anything about Fallout 76. My understanding is that it is a games as a service game where you are playing online with other people. Mm. And I never played it. I can't imagine that it had tons of players because it's older. It had a rough start. A lot of people were yeah. very unhappy with it when it first came out. And, you know, the developers did what they could to try and rescue it. Um but the you know that the number of people who are playing these Fallout games just doubled because people want to go back to the you know they want to watch the show and then hop back in and, and play more of it. So have you watched the show? Obviously, yeah, I, we won't we won't do any spoilers here, everybody. Sure. So don't worry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm six episodes of the eight in, so I'm, I'm just almost done at this point. And so I'm loving it. And it's, you know, it's not tied to the game in any way either, like in terms of just the storyline. It's similar in some of the kind of tropes of it and whatnot, but it's not the same. And but it's it's a, just a great show, you know, and there it's funny because there are moments where like the show will go to like a specific area. And I'm like, I remember a very similar area in Fallout 3. And I like got in there and I was stuck because I was pinned down by some ghouls or whatever. And I was out of ammo and like I, I survived something how 
And mm-hmm. so those are the things that made me reinstall Fallout 3 and 4 because I was like, I want to go back to those kind of moments that I had. I want to go back and see that building that I remember from the game. And so that's why I went and installed it. It's kind of crazy because, you know, by installing the Steam one, I've lost all of my save game progress because I played it on the 360 back in the day, you know. And like I mentioned, all the DLC, like I played all that thing. I maxed out that game back in the day. Very rare for me. Three, so, right? For three, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so it is going to be interesting to just start over from scratch and kind of not have that. I think it's probably better because if I jumped into the Xbox version and I was like, okay, I'm like super overpowered and I don't remember where anything is or what button does what. Uh, So it might be better just to go in uh, free, like a, like brand new. You ever play new Vegas? I did. I didn't like it. I got maybe halfway through it. I've not, I don't know what it is, but I've never been a big fan of like when a different publisher or developer makes a sequel to like the game that I really invest in. So I didn't mm. like New Vegas that much. I didn't like uh, Bioshock 2, even though people think it's like better. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I like that initial vision and feeling of that uh, primary creator. And when it goes to somebody else, I have a really hard time following it. I don't know why. Yeah, I didn't even realize that that wasn't made by Bethesda um, because I never played. I own New Vegas. I think I got Mm -hmm. it like on a Humble Bundle or like Steam Sale or something. And I've played, I don't know, like 10 minutes of it just so that I could check out what it was like to play it on the Steam Deck when the Steam Deck first came out. Mm -hmm. By the way, there are some fantastic like controller layouts that people have made on the steam deck to play fallout new vegas so that's a really good way to play it it runs at Mm. like 60 frames per second it's not one of the ones that got updated which is unfortunate but my favorite is fallout 3 that's the Mm. one that i fell in love with i played fallout 1 and fallout 2 like back in the day and they were great but fallout 3 grabbed a hold of me and did not let go and i i played all the way through that hundreds of hours in that game well maybe not hundreds at least a hundred hours in that game just exploring everything um so i don't see myself going back and playing fallout 3 again but new vegas is one that i definitely want to pick up or uh, give another shot because i know know, it's made by obsidian as well that's oh, like okay. one of their first major games. And so like you can feel the shell of the further like long game outer worlds and all that stuff. Very similar to New Vegas because it's like the same kind of developer feel. Yeah, and everybody seems to say that New Vegas is like the best one. Um mm. it's definitely better than four because I didn't like four. Um I didn't like four, I think for the same reason that you didn't. I didn't want to build a base. I just want I didn't want to like I remembered like trying to plug things in and like running wires and stuff and i was like this is this is stupid this is not what i want to do i want to be out there in the wilderness fighting dudes and and you know getting radiation poisoning or whatever and yeah follow spending bottle for me yeah follow up for me should be an experience where you're stuck in a situation that you didn't expect and you got to figure out how to get out of it like that's mm-hmm. Fallout to me, basically. And so the idea of like building a town or whatever, like that's that's Minecraft in my Fallout game. Like I don't want to do that. <laughs> There's peanut butter in my chocolate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so I saw one episode so far, mm-hmm. and my wife and I we're we're hyped for it. We're enjoying it. So I can't wait to get back into that world and uh, watch more of it. Um, how do you feel about the binging it versus the week to week release? Do, mm. do you have a preference? Not that that's related to video games. I'm just curious. Yeah, I uh, I like the binge part of it just because it's on my own timeline. I don't. I rarely will binge a TV show. Uh, what'll happen if it's a weekly release and it's not something that I'm like edge of my seat need to watch every episode like whatever Game of Thrones or whatever? Um, then I will just wait till it's done and then watch it Mm. in my own time so i'm i'm all for that kind of initial release i don't think i'm the primary like target person for any of this stuff you know what i mean like i don't really watch weekly and you know even when i do have something that's binge worthy i'm not going to binge it anyway and so um yeah i I don't really care either one way or the other but i do personally prefer to have everything all at once just because it gives me the freedom i want that's fair um, all right, let's uh, let's let's dip back into Russ's uh, wheelhouse, <laughs> and that is um, the App Store updated its its um, guidelines and said, you know what, emulation, you guys can make your emulators, put it on the App Store, and uh, we're not going to turn them down, which is uh, a, a new shift. I you know a lot of people posted videos saying 
this is huge news and a lot of people looked at the language and said well i don't think that this is big as you think it is because it you know it's not gonna actually work well it's here and it works and it looks like uh you know now of course there's gonna be people android people who are like oh we've been doing this for years yeah i get it right. we don't care it's fine but other people haven't been able to or they didn't want to jump through all the hoops and so now everybody can and it's awesome um, I saw that you made your first short in a very long time. Oh, I did. And, yeah. And uh, it's about the IGBA uh, a retro emulator, I think is the name of it. Terrible name, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on iOS emulation? Yeah, so a few things to unpack with that. Number one is as soon as I saw it was available, I tested it out, got it working and everything. I was like, oh, this is cool. So I made like a quick video about it on Twitter. And then people were like, oh, this is neat. And so I was like, well, let me make a short, like a YouTube short. I haven't made one of those in like a year. And this seems like a great time to be like, hey, there's now this emulator. This is how it works. Uh, what I didn't realize at the time is that this app is like stolen code from an yeah. old emulator from back in the day. Like... um. So the original developer of Alt Store and the Delta emulator, which I think a lot of people know about on iOS, his first project was this one called GBA for iOS, which he made in high school. And so apparently this is just a rip of that. And this is before my time. Like I didn't I didn't really understand what was going on here. And so I'm I'm like the guy who was like, oh, yeah, hey, check out this app. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm the bad guy because I'm like, hey, check out this stolen app. Like I didn't realize, you know. <laughs> And so well, in Russ's defense, how the hell is Russ supposed to know that? You know, like <laughs> well, I didn't know it until yeah. somebody posted this. Right. And so I put a correction out there and stuff, but all the same, it's kind of crappy that they did that. They also put ads in there, which is a pain, but I only saw the ads like when you're browsing the game. Some people are like, oh, the ads are popping up while I'm playing. Didn't happen to me. And maybe I'm just not playing long enough, but I played it for about an hour and didn't have any issues. Anyway, it's cool that it's there. It pulls from your files app. So you like this is all the things that people said, oh, Apple's not going to allow this, but it's, it does all those things. So I have like my iCloud drive, which is synced with like my Mac and everything else. So I just threw like some ROMs onto that iCloud drive. And then on my iPhone, you can access that from your files app, right? So you just go in your files app. You go into your iCloud drive, then I pull up my whatever Game Boy ROM, click on it, and then open it in that iGBA app. So it's kind of like pushing it over to that. And then it just launches it. It adds it to its library. It even like moves the file into the correct position that it needs to, to see in the library or whatever. And that's it. You can play the game. I mean, it's it's a touchscreen emulator. So you're just tapping on the, you know, the thing on your, you know, with your fingers or whatever. It's not very accurate. Uh, but you could play role-playing games like that, absolutely no problem. Uh, it works with an external controller, and so that, that worked as well. But I, I'm like carry, where I don't want to carry around an external controller. Be like, oh, I got five minutes to kill. Let me pull this other thing out of my pocket, put it on here, and now I can play Golden Sun. And so that's never been a match for me. But the idea of just at least being able to pull it up and be like, hey, I got five minutes to kill. I can get a little bit further in Golden Sun, which has save states and all that stuff, so I can play a little bit more. Yeah, I don't see myself ever using it when I have access to something like a Miu Mini Plus or, you know, in, in the future, maybe something else new that has built-in controls. I mean, like you said, it, it has access to third-party controls. I don't know why that just popped up. Let me close. <laughs> uh, close. Um, uh, you know, it has third-party controllers, so you could use like one of those telescopic controllers. Like I have a backbone. It's a PlayStation themed one. I know you have one that you really mm -hmm. like. What's it called again? The game, sir. G eight Galileo. It just right. rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like those Sony headphones with their naming. Um, right. but like that seems like a good way to do it. If you don't want to have an extra device, my personal preference is that I want to have a device that is dedicated to my emulation stuff and that's what it's for and that's the only thing that i use it for the Mi mini plus is perfect for me mm -hmm. because when i play retro games i'm usually playing games from my childhood you know uh atari and nes super nintendo and once you get to N64 and PlayStation and stuff like that, I really don't play those games as much. And if I'm going to, I usually will. Honestly, I won't. I just usually don't play those games. So even yeah. though I have access to Final Fantasy VII and I've loaded it up 
many times. I have never gotten very far because I could like I feel like the 8 bit, the 16 bit and previous like there's something about that era of gaming that translates and holds up really well. Mm-hmm. And when you get closer to modern gaming but still old stuff, I feel like a lot of those games you can see the cracks more. If that make does that make sense, Russ? Yeah, totally. Like uh it's either going to be like the janky polygons or just inaccurate, you know, emulation and stuff. You can see that a little bit more easily. I mean, to be honest, though, too, even if you're playing an NES game on your Mew Mini, it's like not the same experience, not a CRT, you know, all those things that we yeah. had back in the day. So I totally get why none of it is like perfect. But, uh, you know, what's interesting, though, is that like it's really about the age brackets and demographics, because, you know, when I when I have a YouTube short, I also will upgrade it to in- or upload it to Instagram Reels as well as TikTok. And I'm just like kind of triple dipping my my videos at that point. And I have very small following on like TikTok, for example, like 8000 followers or something. But I uploaded it and it took off like 200,000 views as opposed to like 20,000 views on YouTube with my 475,000 subscribers. And so mm-hmm. it just definitely went way beyond what it should have when I when I uploaded it. I thought it would get a couple hundred views or something. So that and the comments, you know, hundreds of comments and it's all just like how do I get this working? Oh, this is so awesome. Wow, you're playing Game Boy Advance. It's got, you know, Golden Sun, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it re, you know, TikTok skews more young, obviously. Uh, but there are people excited about the idea of just being able to play these games on their phone. Maybe they've never heard of a Mew Mini. You know what I mean? Like they, yeah. they don't understand that. Or maybe it just doesn't appeal to them to have two things. But there is an appeal there for like the thing they already have to be able to play a game on it without having to like buy it or on the app store and that kind of stuff. And so um, anyway, yeah, it was just kind of an interesting like uh, case study for me where I was like, wow, these three platforms have completely different reactions to it. The YouTube one was just full of people being like, this thing's stolen. It's got ads like don't do it, you know, play on your Mew Mini, all that kind of stuff, which is like kind of my sentiment as well. Like I get all that, you know, but the TikTok people didn't care. They're just like, oh, this is so cool. And if you turn off your Wi-Fi, you won't get the ads, you know, like they're already figuring out how to like circumvent the ads and stuff like that. So very younger uh, in terms of an audience, but it was just kind of cool to see these three demographics and how they reacted. If you, I mean, if you load the right kind of games on there, like you said, like an RPG, like this is the perfect Pokemon thing. Right. Like you could just take Pokemon with you and you get, oh, I got a couple of minutes. I'll have a quick battle on Road 17 or whatever. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't really play Pokemon games. Um, so. Like, that seems like a really good use case. I will say that uh, something that I didn't get a notification when I, because I installed the app Hmm. and I didn't get a thing. You like on on iOS, you get a pop up that says, This would like to track your location. Do you want to allow it? And I always say, No, go to, you know, get bent. No, thank you. I'm not interested in your nonsense. I didn't get a pop up on this, but then everybody was saying that this was tracking people's location like it had location stuff turned on which a there's no reason that an app like this should have that um i'm guessing that had something to do with ads but i don't know um but did you get a location sharing pop-up on yours maybe i just missed it no, nothing. nothing like when I okay. load it up, just like a old school app, like no, no permissions or anything like that. So yeah. definitely some weird things going on. It's also listed as a developer tool, not as a game or anything else like that. And so like I saw that in the charts, like it was charting on the developer tools thing. And so I wonder if because it's in that genre or category, if it has different permissions requirements or something mm. like that. I'm not really sure how that works. If you know why that is, feel free to let us know and educate us uh, down in the comments. Um, but do you think we're going to see RetroArch on uh, iOS soon, anytime soon? You know, uh, so I've been kind of following just seeing who's saying what. And so the Delta emulator uh, developer, the person who runs Alt Store, he has kind of insinuated that he's interested in doing it, but nothing clear from him. Uh, RetroArch has said they are waiting to see if others get approved first and before they invest their time in it. So well, that makes sense. See it. If, if, if we see others popping up, you know, the Sega Saturn developer, uh, Dev Miyax, so he does Yabasan Shiro. Uh, so he submitted his about a week and a half ago, but I haven't heard anything since as far as whether or not it got approved. Obviously, it hasn't gotten approved because it's not on the store, but maybe it's still in the you know review process. But 
Um, so yeah, we'll see how this goes. You know, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, a lot of people have to use the alt store versions of these apps, which is like side loading it basically, because mm -hmm. uh, some of these high end emulators like Dolphin requires JIT like uh, programming. And so that is something that's not available with app store apps. So I don't expect that you'll be able to play GameCube uh, at least very well. If they do put it on the Dolphin on there, it's not going to have access to all of the hardware features. And so as a result, I don't know, even with like an M1 iPad, you're probably only going to be able to play it at like a 1X resolution, if that. And so um, so we're really talking about retro games at this point. We're not yeah. talking about being able to emulate the high-end stuff. Interesting. Well, you brought up the Sega Saturn, which is interesting because Sega has this really strange tweet. Um, this is from Sega Official. Let me put this up on screen for the uh, viewers. I'll get rid of this. Share. And um, this is, it says Sega, at Sega Official. I believe it's them. They got a little gold check mark. Uh, it was easier when the, there was only one color check mark Twitter, but whatever. <laughs> and it uh, shows like a little miniature Sega Saturn. Um, it's white, not mm -hmm. like the black one for the US. So I wonder if this will come. I, oh, do you, do you read? this stuff i know you like no, know lots of languages i can't read japanese no oh okay <laughs> i get my wife to do it and she it's funny my wife can read japanese but doesn't understand it but a lot of it like i can't remember if it's hiragana or katakana one of those gotcha. is actually like english style words but written in japanese so she'll read it and she doesn't know what she's saying and she'll be like fire and i'm like oh fire emblem <laughs> Cause like I have her look at the, like, oh, the covers right. of NES games and stuff and like, what is this game? And she's like, Fudd. you know? And so like, I figure it out because she says it and then I can kind of figure out, you know, just communication wise what it is. So anyway, yeah, I cannot read Japanese. So I don't know what's going on there. All right. Well, they tweeted this out and all, I, I mean, according to Google translate, which, you know, is a thousand percent accurate. Oh, it yeah. says the answer is dot, dot, dot here. And then they mm. show a Sega Saturn. Now I am a big fan of these mini consoles that we got starting with the nes uh the classic nes classic, classic yep. and then the super nintendo classic and then we had the abysmally huge failure that is the playstation classic but we had two um sega genesis minis right. i think they called them yep. and they were both pretty cool and i'm a i'm a i i have all of those things i also have the commodore 64 uh mini um would you buy the sega dream wait, wait no sega saturn. saturn um mini i think i would like it's so hard to emulate sega saturn and if they can do it and they can do it correctly like if it shows like sega rally championship without all the crap happening in the road which happens with a lot of the emulators like it's accurate like it and turns all black have, and flashes the road. Yeah, there's like it's almost like there's like dust happening, but it's like not there if you use Beetle Saturn. And so it's like something that's happening on the on the road when you're when you're playing in like a darker like the dirt road in Sega Rally Championship. It's like one of my gauges always is like, is this accurate or not? Let's see. You know, if they can nail that and get it working without having to fiddle settings and you know make sure that you've got like the most powerful hardware or whatever, that would be pretty cool. Sega Saturn is like my. Uh, white whale is that what they call it you know like it's like mm -hmm. the thing that I chased so long where I used to see it in magazines I'm like this is amazing it's the next level you know because I had the Genesis then the 32X and Sega CD and all that so I was a Sega person during that kind of ecosystem so next generation for me was not like Nintendo 64 and it was Sega Saturn that looked amazing never got to play it and so oh. I still never played on original hardware and so this might be a close approximation right there yeah, I I had a Sega Saturn. I, I bought, I was a sucker, and I bought all of the Sega stuff. So mm. I had the Sega Genesis. I had the, I didn't have the 32X, but I did have the Sega CD. Mm. Um, and then I ended up picking up, I ended up having the Saturn and the Dreamcast. And, you know, Sega kept saying, hey, this is the new cool thing. And I'd be like, yes. <laughs> and I got it. I trust you. And then you. Sega yeah. would say, here's the next cool thing. And you're like, you guys just, you just put this out. What are you doing to me? Like, <laughs> yeah, it was really, really frustrating. Uh, the Saturn was very cool. I'm just looking through like a list of games. What were what would be the games that you would if you were going to make your perfect Sega Saturn game or, or uh, uh, mini system? Can you name like a couple of games that you would 
want to see on there? Yeah, you know, uh, like first and foremost would be probably Virtua Fighter 2. Like that to <clears> me <throat> was like the best Virtua Fighter because Virtua Fighter 1 was like amazing in that it was like 3D and in the arcades and whatnot. It kind of blew my mind back in the day. And then Virtua Fighter 2 came out and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like real life people. Like that's how good the graphics were, you know. Right. And so that was always like a special feeling for me. It was like this huge leap in technology and graphics and stuff. So that's a big one for me. Sega Rally Championship, I love that game. It's hard to control. Um, like, it's always just kind of, like, really bendy feeling, you know? Uh, but I've gotten pretty good at it after all the testing, and so I do want to play that more. And then the third one, like, that's just always been an enigma for me is Panzer Dragoon. Like, I remember hearing that name for years, but, like, oh, this is an amazing thing or whatever it happens to be, you know? And I didn't, I didn't understand what it was. I didn't realize that it was like an on rail shooter, kind of like Star Fox, you know, but riding a dragon. Uh, I didn't understand any of that stuff back in the day. I just heard that there was mythical game that you could only play on the Sega Saturn. Uh, and I just obviously didn't have the $400 or whatever it cost to buy a Saturn in the game back in the day. And so I never really got to play it. I can emulate it now and I've played the first couple levels, but um, I don't know something about being able to play it on something that looks like a Sega Saturn makes me want to play it more. Yeah. Um, for me, I would love to, well, obviously, Daytona USA. I mm. loved Daytona USA, and so that game has to be included, if for no other reason than just so that I can hear the guy screaming Daytona. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Russ, did you see that they had, like, somebody had recorded that guy singing the Daytona song again, like, a couple no. of months ago? No. I'm gonna see if I can find it and I'll send it to you. If I do, if I do find it, I'll also include it in the uh, in the show notes down below the like button. Um, so D Daytona USA, a yeah. good call with Virtua Fighter Two. Mm. That game was amazing. I loved it. Um, Shiny Force Three, absolutely want to have that one on there. And then X Men versus Street Fighter uh, oh, was yeah. another one that I I really really liked. Um, but, you know, let us know in the comment section, what are your favorite Saturn games? And would you buy a dedicated Sega Saturn Mini, or would you just keep playing on your emulation? Like, that's the thing that makes it, like, because I, I bought all these things, but I never load them up and play them. I always just play the emulated version on, like, my Miu Mini Plus or whatever. Right. I mean, if you think about it from a cost perspective, right? So they're, they're probably not going to be able to sell this console for more than like $100. Like say, say it's $99. And that's kind of steep for one of these classic consoles, right? But if you could yeah. play Sega Saturn games on that for $99, you cannot buy anything that will emulate Sega Saturn accurately for $99. You can't do it. You're going to have to spend 200 bucks or so to get a really high powerful Android kind of capable device or you'll have to get like a computer basically uh, because you're not going to be able to use one of those cheap handhelds to play Sega Saturn. So $99 to be able to play this thing on a TV and it's going to come with a controller or whatever, that's a steal. And so if they are able to do something like that, that'd be amazing. I think it's actually a good value compared to emulation. Yeah. And then uh, you also have like a, a controller for the Sega Saturn, you have a, like, it had a weird, it had a weird controller. Like, the D-pad mm -hmm. on the Sega Saturn was was really strange. I'm trying to bring that up on screen real quick. Uh, the D-pad was weird. Like, it was, it was like a circle, but it was, right. you would pivot around the middle. Um, and then it had six buttons instead of four buttons. So a lot of times when you go to play, like, let's say that I do, um emulate a Saturn game and I'm using like a, a, an Xbox controller or something like that, the inputs are weird and right. it makes it less fun, which is like the reason why I never play Nintendo 64 emulation because the mm -hmm. inputs are weird. They don't yeah. match up the way that they, the way that they should. And yeah. because of that, it's weird. So like you're going to get Re I mean, if the past is a good indicator, you're going to get reasonably authentic feeling controllers. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, you know, Ambernick made a device last year called the RG Arc. And this thing is shaped like a Sega Saturn controller, it even has the Sega Saturn controller, like um, color schemes and stuff. But the chip in it is not powerful enough to play Sega Saturn reliably. Like you can play a few games and stuff, but you can't. And so it's such a huge wasted potential in the sense that that's funny. One of my thumbnails shows up there. But um, yeah, it's like 
this thing looks like it should play Sega Saturn and it can barely play like, you know, 10 games or whatever. And so just a huge waste. And I'd rather play on a, you know, a Sega Saturn classic than something like this. Uh, so I'm trying, you said it's funny for the audio listeners. I brought up a Google search of the RG arc and Russ said, Oh, that's funny. One of my thumbnails showed up and I clicked on the one that had a green background. Is this it? No, it's the one that you're it's on the right one now, to the, the left one, with the, the keyboard. keyboard. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the green background was the first thing that I checked for, but when that wasn't it, this was my second that I was going <laughs> to guess funny. at. <laughs> yeah. And this, even in that thumbnail, you can thumbnail see, language. Yeah. You can see in the thumbnail, like I put a Sega CD game and then Marvel versus Capcom because like a street fighter fighting game because of the six buttons. I didn't put a Sega Saturn game in the thumbnail. Cause I was like, I don't even want to like hype this as being something you can play Sega Saturn on. It's great for Sega Genesis and it's great for street fighter games. And that's about it. Yeah. Well, hopefully that it, it it does come out. And do you think they could go higher than a hundred? I just me thinking about it. I'd pay one twenty for it. Okay. It's like a Saturn. It's a new generation. It's a lot better hardware. I'm assuming in order to get it to work, I'd pay one twenty for that. You know. And I think, you know, Sega Saturn is known as being an expensive, like, console experience. If you wanted to rebuy it right now and try to buy some games, holy crap, you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars to try to recreate that experience. So this is yeah. still a bargain, even for those, like, classic console, like, connoisseurs. Yeah, a lot of people, like, they were very unhappy with the PlayStation Mini. And I'm with you. Mm. It's not a great experience. But that came with two PlayStation controllers. And they're just USB. So right. if I want to use them as PlayStation controllers for a more authentic PS1 experience, I can. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they could probably, for a Sega Saturn, people will get mad at me because I'm pushing the number up higher. If they included two controllers, I think that they could push it to 150. And that, would, that would not increase their cost very much at all. Yeah. But it better I wonder have how well some good two-player games. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder how well it's going to sell, though, because it's not like people want to recreate their beloved childhood of being able to play, like, for Nintendo and Super Nintendo, sold like hotcakes because everyone had that. Not a lot of people had the Sega Saturn. So is the target audience going to be people who never got it in the first place, or is it going to be that really small niche audience that knew it and loved it from back in the day? So that'll be really interesting just to see who ends up buying it if it does come out and uh, how the sales go in terms of that. Yeah, I feel like the audience... Um, like the pool of people who are willing to buy a mini console every single time one comes out gets smaller and smaller right. and smaller because a lot of people who have bought these things in the past, they bought them, they hooked them up, they played them. They were like, oh my God, this is so cool. Takes me back. A week later, it hasn't <laughs> been touched since, right? right? Like that's just been taken up an HDMI port on the back of their TV and they've probably forgotten that they have this thing. Yeah. It's and almost like, I, um, guitar hero, you know, where it's like <laughs> yeah. decreasing dividends where it was amazing at first. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, there's another one, a new guitar and stuff. And yeah, people were just over it, which is crazy because they're still magical rock band and guitar hero are still magical experiences, but we just got tired of it. And so I can see that with the classic consoles too. Yeah. Um, anyway, if you guys could have, one classic console that we don't already have which one would you uh which one would you ask for let us know in the comments down below um all right let's uh let's wrap this up with um i guess i guess i want to talk about this ridiculous idea from mike yabara who uh was he used to be in charge over at blizzard and he said something that I, I cannot imagine very many people are going to agree with. And he, even he admits that this is a, a, an, an unpopular idea. But he says that it would be cool if after you finish playing a game, if you could leave a tip for the devs. Like you finish <laughs> playing and you're like, oh, that was a really cool experience. Let me give them an extra $20 or, or uh, X whatever, uh, X dollars. You know, and he even says, I know it's not going to be a popular idea, but, you know, this was worth my $70 and they didn't try and nickel and dine me. So I'm going to give them an extra $10 or $20. And so first off, as like somebody who used to work as a waiter, 
I friggin hate tipping because that meant that I worked for less than minimum wage and I got, yes, I earned more than minimum wage, but it was always like a hassle and you would get like these tables that come in and they would spend like so much money and then they would give you like a 15 cent tip or something like that. Um, so the idea of adding tipping into another aspect of life is irritating yeah. to me. Um, and as somebody who travels quite a bit, I'm sure that you don't like you're like, yeah, we go places and they don't they don't do tipping in other places like right. we do. Yeah, it's um, funny. There's yeah, the ahead. other part of that is like, uh, is this Blizzard guy going to take a cut of the, that tip? Like when they have the tip jar or whatever, or is 90% going to go to the devs or 100%? And you know it's going to be 90 oh, zero or 0%. That's that's <laughs> the thing that I think of. I In fact, I tweeted, I said, there's a less than 0% chance that nobody who actually did the work gets the money for this. Yeah. Well, it leads me to think about what I would do if I really did appreciate a game developer. And again, I'm going to go back to like the music thing. So if I buy an album and, you know, it's my $10 or whatever, and I love it, what I end up doing later on is I buy the vinyl version because I want to make mm -hmm. sure it's in my collection. I have it forever. And then I'll buy the t-shirt and then I'll go and see those guys in concert or they'll sign up for their main mailing list or whatever. Like I'll do all those things so that I, I've invested now in that person because they have won me over. Right. And I think a game developer is the same way. If there's a game studio, it makes them an incredible game or it's like a specific figurehead that was like a part of it or whatever. I will follow them on Twitter. I will see what they're up to. I will I will be invested in that stuff. I'm not going to buy a t-shirt of a video game, but that's mostly because I just have too many band t-shirts. But it's a similar idea. Like it's like you would invest in that person just for the products they're creating. It's like natural order of things where people will just kind of figure out how they can support somebody and I don't need an executive to tell me how to do that. Yeah, and not only that, the idea the thing is is that the games are made by such huge teams at this point like if russ donates like decides to do a, a, a ten dollar tip when he finishes a game yeah good luck for me ever getting to that point where i hit the button <laughs> because i never finish games um but you know russ does that that ten dollar tip like who like the idea that anybody who actually did work would get that money never gonna happen right. and that money would just go to like it would just it would just go to the CEOs. Yeah. Like and it's I like, just, okay, I want the sound designer to get my $10. He's not getting <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Let me pick a name from the credits. I'm going to be like, oh, uh, I don't know what this person does in the movies, but the best boy. You know, mm. you always see the best yeah. boy in the credits. Or You're like, gaffer, I don't know what yeah. that is. I'm going to I'm gonna donate $10 to the best boy because he's got the worst job title. <laughs> Right. It's it's almost like, you know, in some restaurants, you know, they pool all the tips. It's not like when you put the money down on your table and your leave, that money is not going to the waitress. It's not going to the chef specifically. It's usually going to go into a pool and then they will divide it up and stuff. And so, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a really hard nut to crack there. I don't know. Follow them on Twitter, like find out the name, see what they're up to, you know, and see how you can support them another way. Yeah, like Ko-Fi. A lot of them will have like Ko-Fi, which I don't really right. understand what it is, but they always have it on their they always people always have Ko-Fi's and it says buy me a coffee. So, yeah, yeah. That's a better way than supporting them through the game where it's going to be siphoned off by the the the, you know, the guys whose job is to turn a a red spreadsheet into a black spreadsheet instead of somebody <laughs> whose job is to make a game that's compelling. Right. Um we had a question a couple of episodes ago and we just never got to it um, but this one's from zach 62 482 and he says nintendo should sell roms officially i'm sorry sell roms and officially sank in F uh, foss which is free and open source software emulators i'd immediately switch back to being a fan if they did this so let's leave leave aside the fact that nintendo would never do this but my question for you, Russ, and for anybody watching this, is how much is a reasonable amount for Nintendo to sell you a ROM that uses a free and open source emulator so that you can play it on your device of choice, whether that be a phone, uh, an Android phone, an iPhone, uh, Miu Mini Plus, your computer, whatever. Whatever it is that you want to use it on, what's a fair price? And 
unfortunately for Russ, I didn't prepare him with with that I was going to ask this question. So I'm throwing yeah. you under the bus. What do you think's fair? I think the only price can be the full like digital store retail price. You know what I mean? The full sixty dollars or whatever. The way I'm thinking for a about ROM? it. Is, yeah, it's the game. You're buying the game. Well, okay, hold on. Are you ta- so oh, you're talking you... about like old games. You're talking about okay, like NES yeah. Let's games make sure okay. that we're talking about right. the same thing because my <laughs> I brain, about... when I hear yeah. emulation, I ignore Switch. Um, <laughs> now yeah, I know that's a going. really good point. <laughs> okay, so I thought we were guess... talking about Yuzu and stuff, and like, okay, yeah, yeah, it didn't even occur to me. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's, so let's, let's change gears and yeah. let's break this into two conversations, uh, old games and new games separately. Well, we already yeah. know new games, $60. And that makes sense to me. Right. It's a new game. So like a Steam what about game old games? Something. So an old game, 10 bucks, you know, like that seems reasonable for me. They used to be $5 on the virtual store, whatever they used to call it, virtual console store on, uh, the Wii. That mm-hmm. used to be five dollars for an NES game. Sometimes they charge like eight dollars or ten dollars for like a Nintendo sixty four game, depending on the game and stuff. Um, but yeah, five dollars it seemed like a pretty good standard. If it was ten dollars and the ability to use it on other platforms, we could just scroll through a store and and download it and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd do that. I'd pay ten dollars for Mario two. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense because when you're talking about selling a ROM. Like Nintendo did do that. They sold ROMs. They sold them on the virtual console, just like you just said, Russ. But those were locked and you couldn't get access to those and you couldn't use them on other stuff. So, you know, in order to make it worth their while, I think, yeah, uh, doubling that price to $10. And there's going to be people that say, wow, that's too much. They don't need that much money. Uh, Yeah, I I got you. But you could just do it for free. If you want, right. you can. I don't condone piracy, but you can just do it for free. I'm just trying to get these companies. Like, I would like these companies to preserve their games, and that's one way that they can do it. Obviously, Nintendo can only do that with stuff that they have the rights to. So all of those third-party games that are made by companies that may or may not even exist anymore, like, that stuff is never going to show up. But, man, it would be awesome if they would just sell us the ROMs and we could put them on whatever. Yeah. I mean, make a whole store out of it, put some of them on sale or whatever, you know, have the whole ecosystem going on there and give us the ability to just kind of feel it out and they can drop the prices if people aren't buying or all those things where they figure out where the right fit is. But for me, yeah, 10 bucks or so uh, for the peace of mind, getting a game, I'm not going to buy, you know, a thousand games or whatever, but I will, I'll buy some here and there. I definitely would do that to be able to have some sort of sanctioned way of playing these games. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen from Nintendo specifically. Oh, it'll never happen. I, in fact, I don't see it happening with pretty much anybody, especially because you have... There's an easy way. I mean, Nintendo doesn't do this, but all of the other companies do, where they take their old games and they re- they release them on Steam. You know, mm-hmm. they're there on Steam. And my guess, I could be wrong, but my guess is a lot of times there's an emulator and they've sold, they've put the ROM and the emulator together, and then they've packaged that and sold it to you on Steam. Because I can't imagine that they went through and ported all of these old games in order yeah. to play, especially things like the Sega, whatever collection. I can't, I, I own it. It's it's awesome. But it's mm-hmm. like, I think it's just ROMs. You know what I mean? Right. You know, it's interesting, too, because, like, the more modern indie develop- developers, those who make, like, some certain games that can play on, like, say, for example, Sega Genesis. So there's a company called Neofid Studios. They're they're out of Europe. And so they make a game called Demons of Asterborg and a couple others. And so those games, you can buy them on Steam. And when you buy them inside the installation, you'll find your bin file, which is a Genesis ROM. And then you can take that ROM and play it on your emulators. And so it's kind of best of both worlds. You know what I mean? You can also buy the Genesis cartridge from them as well if you want to have a physical copy. The thing is, they are releasing a like DX version of one of their games and they're putting on Kickstarter and they have said publicly they're not going to make this a ROM at all. You used to be able to, like for the original game, you could even just buy the ROM for like $10 as well. They're not doing any of that stuff because they said they got pirated so much with that ROM file that people weren't buying it. They, they could see how many people were playing it and not many people were buying it or whatever, how are they were measuring it. And so they've, they've decided that the only way you can play this new DX title, which is going to be a Game Boy Advance version of the same game, uh, is it by buying the physical cartridge. And so that was kind of interesting for me is that they're going back and they're like, no, we're not doing this emulation stuff. We're losing money. Do, do you think that 
making that decision and changing changing that is actually going to stop piracy from happening well they said that the 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 game itself like it won't even run on an emulator like because it's too complicated for the Game Boy Advance emulator so it's kind of two birds of one stone oh, they're okay. like it's too complicated it's not going to run on the emulator and we don't want to do it because we lost a lot of money with the last one and so right. it's not even a possibility they they like so they've made a decision creatively or just financially to to not allow for any sort of emulation which sucks because i liked putting demons of asterborg on all my handhelds i bought the thing you know i had the cartridge and all that stuff but i like the ability to play a modern genesis game as well and that's not going to happen with the game boy advance version um when i was at pax um i ran into bob wolf and we were talking mm -hmm. about like what games did we get to see and uh he was talking about a rugrats game <laughs> that has like they said that they're going to launch a demo and it's a Rugrats game that has like a demake version of it and right. that that is it is actually a rom and they specifically said you could get the rom from our demo and it wouldn't be very hard like they're using that as a promotion tool um because they I think that they they understand that no amount of getting in people's way is actually going to stop piracy. But you can use this as like a marketing tool in order to make it easier for people to discover your game. And I think that that's right. really cool. Not that this other company that you're talking about is in the wrong for doing it because clearly people are stealing their stuff and yeah, that they sucks. Gotta eat. Yep. They got to eat. So. You know, they got to have those restrictions in in some way, and uh, that's the thing that they decided to do. So um, what's the name of that game again? Because I'm interested. <laughs> Demons of Astaborg. It's a weird name, but A-S-T-E-B-O-R-G. And so awesome. it came out a few years ago, uh, but it's Genesis game. You can also grab the Steam version and get the ROM from that as well. And I think it came out on Neo Geo as well or something like that. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, Russ, you put out a video this morning. What's it all about? Oh my gosh. So I made a 45 minute long video about uh, the Game Boy FPGA. And so this is made by a company called Funny Playing. They're known for like mods and stuff like screens and whatnot. So they have their own like FPGA handheld, kind of like an analog pocket, but uh, like only plays Game Boy and Game Boy Color, only two cores, as opposed to this thing, which can play, you know, a dozen cores. It's only $83, and that includes the board, the shell, the buttons, the screen, all that stuff, battery and whatnot. And so $83 to have basically a Game Boy and Game Boy Color, no original parts to it, but it play, you know, it's FPGA, so it's hardware emulation. So it's got that you know, great accuracy and all that stuff too, but at a bargain price. If you got a Game Boy Color and tried to mod it, it would cost you 150 bucks at least. This is $83 and is better. And so... Uh, I made a whole video, 45 minutes of me just ranting about why I liked it so much and why it was like the best Game Boy experience that I've had to date. And so uh, that was a lot of fun to put together, but man, a lot of work. I struggle with the idea of picking up one of those things because it only has two buttons. It mm -hmm. doesn't have four buttons. And so I can't play Super Nintendo games on it. I can't yeah. play, you know, and I feel like I'm limited. Whereas with like the Miu Mini Plus or an Ambernic right. RG, whatever thing, I can't remember what they're called. Um, like you have more buttons, and so there's more games that you can yeah. play. And as much as I like having a dedicated emulation device, I don't necessarily like the idea of having a dedicated emulation device that can't play the 16-bit stuff because it doesn't yeah. have enough buttons. So for me, it's, that's the point. It is, it's just a Game Boy. It's right. just a Game Boy that plays Game Boy and Game Boy Color, and that's it. It's all it can do. You know what I mean? So you got to love those catalogs. You want to only want to play those. Yeah. You only need two buttons. That's all you had available. You're right. And so it's authentic. You know, it's it's emulation, hardware emulation or whatever. I don't want to get into that. But yeah, it's not like original Game Boy experience, but it plays your cartridges, plays flash cards. It is a Game Boy. And so that's kind of why I love it. And I never had a Game Boy growing up. And so that was one of the things I was always chasing after. And mm -hmm. I feel like I finally caught the tiger by its tail. That's awesome. I, I remember I was a kid, my, my friend who lived two, two houses down, he had a Game Boy. And I mm. remember seeing the commercial of the kid playing Tetris against the robot. And like I played, I tried out Tetris on his Game Boy and I was like, this is friggin' terrible. 
because <laughs> the the screen was so bad. That being yeah. said, I, I eventually got a Game Boy Color and had an absolute blast with it. Uh, but thank God we have backlit screens now and batteries are right. are more efficient when it comes to this stuff because. Um, it, while the Game Boy lasted forever on a on a set of double A's, and it really, yeah. really did, that screen was like absolute hot garbage on a stick. Right. Yeah, it's funny. Um, it's almost like a Sega Saturn classic. We're buying a Game Boy classic where it has all the upgraded things to it, but it's still that same experience. And so that's kind of what I love about it. You know, all those n nice quality of life features. It's not perfect. Like it doesn't work with the best flash carts. And so the EverDrive doesn't work with it, at least for me. And so I can't use save states. And so that would mm. be like the one thing that would push me over um, and, and say this thing is like perfect. And so I'm hoping a software update will fix that. But either way, so yeah, super happy with it. I can't make a I can't I can't make a decision as, or I can't identify why I would buy a Sega Saturn uh, Mini in a heartbeat, yeah. but this thing I'm like no thank you. And there's <laughs> way more amazing games on the game. The Game Boy had a fantastic library, especially because this plays Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, right? Like that's a huge Not advanced, li just yeah, just color and, and regular Game Boy. Oh, so it's okay. only the original cartridges, yeah. Well, still, that's that's a huge library. Oh, yeah. it's done. Hundreds, absolutely yep. huge. Anyway, uh, so go check out Russ's uh, video about the what's it called again? FGBA. They're calling it FPGBC. So funny playing Game Boy Color, or it's also FPGA because that's like the the uh, hardware that they're using as well. So yeah, FPGBC. Yeah, and you can find that over at youtubecom slash core. I will leave it linked down below. Uh, as always, you guys could have done anything else with your um, hour and a half, but you decided to hang out with us, and so we appreciate that. If you are looking to watch the show, or I, well, I'm sorry, if you're looking to listen to the show without having any any ads distracting you, uh, then check out the Patreon, uh, also linked uh, down below. And uh, thank you for hanging out with us from the Nerd Nest. Stay rad, everybody.